Welcome, audience that I can't see. <laughs> I'm Eliza Pennypacker, Professor of Landscape Architecture and also a member of the Landscape Architecture Department's Lectures and Exhibitions Committee. And tonight we are kicking off our 2022-23 Bracken Lecture Series. This is a series that was endowed by John R. Bracken, who was a department head in landscape architecture from the 20s until the 50s, quite, quite a long run. Each year, thanks to Dr. Bracken's generosity, we host three to four guests who never cease to inspire our community. And tonight we are delighted to welcome Charles Cross. I'm not going to tell you anything about him because I'm going to turn it over to Healy Parmar, who is going to introduce Mr. Cross. Healy is the president of the Penn State chapter of NOMAS, the National Organization for Minority Architecture Students. Healy, take it away. Thanks, Eliza. Hello, everyone. My name is Healy Parmer, and I am a third year undergrad architecture student and also president of NOMAS. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Charles Cross, who is the Director of Landscape and, Ur uh, and Urban Design at the Detroit Collaborative Design Center, um, also a professor and faculty NOMAS advisor at the University of Detroit Mercy School of Architecture and Communi Community Development, as well as a founding board member of the Black Landscape Architects Network. Before joining the Detroit Collaborative Design Center, Professor Cross designed with Smith Group JJR, Elizabeth Kennedy Landscape Architects, and artist Miss Mary of New York City, as well as the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Natural Resource Conservation Service. Yesterday, Namas had an incredible conversation with Professor Cross about his experiences and the extreme importance of community engagement within design, which is the topic of today's lecture. And with that, I will let Professor Cross take over. Thank you. Thank you, Healy. And I just want to take a moment here and thank everyone here at uh, Penn State. You guys do a top-notch job. Um, this has been a really um, great uh, experience for me. So I've really enjoyed this. So thank you so much uh, for all your um, work and all your help with um, setting this whole thing up. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now and I'm going to talk about uh, some good some good trouble. And we're going to get into uh, into that a little bit. Okay, so you know, John Lewis um, civil rights leader um, uh, has always talked about good trouble, and you know he says, "Hey, go out and get into some good trouble." Um, and sometimes you have to rustle, ruffle some feathers in in the work you do, uh, and so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, you know, Whitney Young. Uh, back in 1968, he's a civil rights leader with the Urban League at this time, and he went to the AIA conference and, and gave them the business. Uh, Whitney Young let them know that, and in one quote, he said, you know, you guys are irrelevant to my community because you're not designing for our community. Um, you know, and, and in this quote, every, every man is our brother and every man's burden is our own. Where poverty exists, all are poorer. Where hate flourishes, all are corrupted. Where injustice reigns, all are unequal. And, and Whitney Young had some powerful words uh, that resonated with quite a few folks in the architecture community um, because it was important uh, that, you know, the black and brown communities weren't being treated fairly due to a whole series of um, race, racist policies, such as redlining and then block busting, um, you know, less uh, uh, situations where resources were not being put into communities, uh, jobs leaving the neighborhoods, and, and then we wonder why the neighborhoods look like they do, right? Uh, and so Whitney Young, um, the AIA has, um, developed, um, created an honor in, uh, to a, an award in honor of Whitney Young. 
And I think it's important. We, we actually won that award in 2017 um, and for our, our work in community design. So this is, I just want to frame this discussion. Um, we also just last week won the Michigan 2022 uh, Michigan ASLA Honor Award uh, for our work in communities and our commitment to uh, working for a more diverse profession. So this gentleman is Steve Vogel. When we talk about good, good trouble, uh, Steve Vogel was actually a student in the 60s, in the late 60s, in Detroit. Uh, and understanding that before, the, before 1968, when uh, Whitney Young made his talk, that uh, there were a, a, a whole, uh, design centers were already being started. But Steve Vogel, um, this quote from Steve Vogel, you know, uh, good design for clients who do not have the ability to pay a non-semester based service and a service to the public agenda are the foundations for the creation of community design centers. Steve Vogel was the dean uh, in the School of Architecture in 1994 when he started the Detroit Collaborative Design Center. Uh, and so we've been around for 28 years, soon we'll be celebrating 30, so we're excited about that. This is our team. Um, and so we have two co-directors, um, myself and a host of other architects. Um, we have Stephanie Onwenu, who's the Public Interest Design Fellow. Um, uh, and then at the bottom corner, well, in the middle, we have Bridget Murphy, who's our business manager, and Dan Patera, who was the previous executive director of the Design Center, who is now uh, the Dean of the School of Architecture and Community Development. And these are some of the backgrounds that the people in this slide have from art architecture to um, graphic design, social work, urban planning, urban design. So we bring a lot of different assets to the table. These are where some of our projects uh, are located. We need to update this map, but We've worked with uh, close to 200, I think over 200 uh, community-based groups in Detroit. We also believe that engagement is very key and very important, whether we're um, trying to um, get the word out about how we engage through um, different publications or it's how, how, how we engage on the ground, especially during the pandemic. Um, where we actually would develop surveys and drop them on people's front porches uh, to make sure that folks were included in the design process because we really believe that's important. Um, in our knowledge sharing, um, we have a couple of books out, Syncopating the Urban Landscape, uh, which chronicles uh, several of our projects and the processes uh, undertaken uh, to um, complete those projects and activist architecture. If you're interested in community design, activist architecture is one you really want to get. These are free downloads on our website. So feel free to go download these. Um, there's a lot of good information here. So from 1994 to the present, we have space at the University of Detroit Mercy in the School of Architecture and Community Development. And so this is our space here. It's a little, little messy. We've been busy. We had a community event. Uh, when this picture was taken, but now we also have a presence in the neighborhood. And that's something when Dan Patera was the executive director thought was very important that we have a presence in the community um, and not just behind the walls of, of the university. So this, uh, we actually, our team uh, worked on this site. There used to be a clothing store actually, and they just held an event celebrating the folks who owned the clothing store and their relatives came back and the kids and they talked about how they had to paint every year they had to put new paint and but we left some things so the floor is the same the the um uh the greenish yellowish greenish tiles were actually the the tin ceiling tiles and um those have been um uh repurposed in the project so our office is is here there's a a conference room, a public space for folks to come work, collaborate. Um, we have little pods on the side for people to take private phone calls. Um, and so it's really open to the community. We share this space with a community-based group 
that's working on business development in the area, uh, organization called Live Six. So some of our research uh, that we um, undertake at the Design Center, and we do different things, but we've done some stuff with urban agriculture. This is our current um, research undertaking, um, looking at black landscape architects who have some sort of connection to Michigan. And I have to uh, thank uh, Mark Miller for all his help and his leadership with the Black Landscape Architects Network. Um, without him, we couldn't have made this happen. So thank you uh, once again, Mark. We really appreciate your help with this. And here's just a couple of uh, samples of what uh, we exhibited. Uh, we're looking at taking this uh, exhibit on the road, and it's still not done, right? So the, eventually, we would like to uh, develop this into an oral history project, capturing stories of black landscape architects and the work and how they came to the to this profession. We also uh, entered, had a wonderful lecture by Kofi Boone, who uh, came in and graced us with his presence. He's very busy because the next morning he had to go to Lansing, Michigan and speak at the Michigan ASLA conference, which I went to as well. Um, but I um, want to thank Kofi for putting the exclamation point in the exhibition uh, at UD Mercy. So some of our work is, is based around teaching as well. So I teach site analysis and design uh, to second year architecture students, but we also teach uh, a, uh, uh, a public interest design studio. Uh, and sometimes it, in the past, uh, we would uh, use those studios to uh, create, uh, do a design build uh, projects. So this is one of um, our um, community partners, the San Juan Block Club. We uh, developed uh, block club signs and um, some landscape strategies with them. And also a, the studio developed a pavilion and on a, uh, a lot in the community where they have meetings, they have events. And uh, so this is part of our team uh, in the design build mode. Also, our teaching comes in another way uh, through our co-op program. Uh, architecture students at University of Detroit Mercy um, have to fulfill a, a co-op uh, requirement uh, to complete their degrees. And so we hire students to give them that, uh, to fulfill that requirement. Um, so that's one way we teach by working with students who have an interest in public interest design uh, as they work towards their degree. Uh, and so that's one way we teach. We also teach a public interest design studio, as I mentioned. We also teach in the Masters of Community Development program. Uh, also, we um, collaborate with faculty members on projects and uh, research and presentations as well. Uh, and we're so happy to uh, be able to announce that this past summer was our inaugural uh, high school internship. And we hosted two interns uh, for the summer, and uh, they uh, we had ex uh, educational modules for them. But also, they've worked on real-world projects, and by the and they also participated in the uh, Noma pipeline, and uh, went along to uh, then complete a portfolio uh, as they uh, as their summer ended. So we um, were really excited about that. That was really a great. A great opportunity for some young people to get experience um, bef and to, to determine whether or not this is something they're interested in. Some of our uh, knowledge sharing as well, you know, articles, papers. This was an article I, I wrote. Uh, this was for, uh, for the My Sites, the Michigan ASLA newsletter. Um, we also lecture and, um, and give presentations as part of our knowledge sharing. Um, but we also uh, developed a series of how-to guides where community groups, uh, where we develop these guides, uh, work with some other partners and funders to actually take this live online where you could actually go in and make your own how-to guides and then distribute them uh, and making it, um, access available um, to, to all. And we just ask that you leave a copy of your work so other folks can, can look at it. Um, so this was just another, and I think we received a seed uh, award for this work. Another program that we ha have is um, our grassroots design access. 
Um, all too often, uh, community-based groups don't have the funding to hire architects or uh, landscape architects um, in a situation uh, where uh, they need they need design, but they can't afford it. And so uh, we approach this from the standpoint that, well, they deserve good design. And because you don't have a lot of money, shouldn't meet, shouldn't exclude you from that. So we've been able to work with funders, um, uh, Kresge Foundation being one, to uh, develop this grassroots design access, giving access to grassroots organizations. Uh, so this is Avalon Village and some of the work they're doing in, transforma in transforming uh, one of the uh, block uh, that they occupy in Highland Park, Michigan, which is inside of the city of Detroit. Uh, here's another project, the Hitha Healing House, which is a um, space that's, um, that's being developed for victims of trauma. And uh, the woman who started this uh, project um, had, had several incidences of trauma in her life, one being the loss of a child and a, a, a baby, I should say. And so she wanted to create a place where people could come and especially in the black community to have access to healing uh, and ways to deal with that trauma. So um, this is another one of those projects. And we're going next week. I think they've started some work on this. So we want to go see the progress. Speaking of those who have um, been victims of trauma or have had uh, situations when there's been problems, uh, we uh, developed a, a working with um, the University of Detroit Mercy's um, campus ministry uh, and the, the facilities um, developed uh, a plan for a healing garden. And this, because of the overwhelming loss by of uh, of people from COVID, for, you know, family and friends, uh, that the university uh, university ministry um, was able to pull funding together to uh, work on this project to create this kind of moment to pause to take a step off of the um, off of the the main walkway and just to to have a silent or a quiet moment um, in 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 nature, right? And so. Um, this is, we built this, um, and we're now starting on a phase two for this. So this is what it looked like the other day. Um, beautiful, just a, a quiet place where you can sit and reflect. This next project is, uh, and, and this is where some of our, where we talk about partnerships and, um, groups coming together around this type of work. Um, this is a collaboration between the American Institute of Architecture Students, uh, the Detroit Collaborative Design Center, and the uh, NOMA students. Uh, and they got together and came up with a design, um, worked on, the, on a rendering, and were able to um, also partner. Um, uh, they also wrote a grant to the Ford Foundation and were able to get funded to, to do some of this work. And working with the uh, city of Detroit and the county um, had some funding involved in this, uh, along with artists from Mary Grove College, and were able to uh, install this with um, our students and community members got involved as well. Uh, and that's one of the things that we were able to connect our students to community, um, but also connecting students to uh, city and um, county resources to develop a wonderful park. We put some interpretive signages, signage in here, uh, did some uh, butterfly gardens that would also handle rain, rainwater. But we also put some of this interpretive signage to talk about the people who cared for this park when the city couldn't. So Mr. King is listed on here. There's another gentleman, I cannot remember his name at this time, but. Mr. King planted flowers and kept the lawn cut so the kids could play on the playground. Um, he since had passed away, but there was still an area where he planted flowers. We were able to take some of those perennials, split them, and then spread them throughout the park. So his perennials are still there uh, at the park. And then we rebuilt the, the flower box that he had uh, built way back that, that pretty much fell apart. Um, so this is a way that we connect community, our students, um, you know, city, county, 
uh, and, and, and where folks can all come together uh, in a way to uh, make a change in this neighborhood for um, the children um, in the neighborhood. This next project is the pop-up shop, is what we called it. And this was a, a collaboration with the city, uh, the Economic uh, Growth Corporation um, in Detroit, uh, and merchants on um, the Avenue of Fashion, as they call it, Livernois Avenue uh, here in Detroit. And what this was, was a space for folks to come test their business, to try their concept. Uh, we kept this space open for 18 months, I believe, and every Thursday, had I believe it was every Thursday, maybe it was one Thursday a month, um, we hosted these events. And after we finished this, 15 new businesses opened up on the on the avenue. Uh, several of them are really thriving. One, we're hoping they don't, she doesn't leave because she can't, her, she started in the pop-up shop and then had brick and mortar on the avenue and she might be outgrowing her space, but uh, Good Cakes and Bakes, wonderful, wonderful place. Um, and these were people who had started out in their home and now they've been able to, to take, come from the informal economy into uh, the formal economy as, as part of, um, uh, of the Avenue of Fashion. Uh, this next project I show is um, a, a project we did with a group, uh, Redeem Detroit, uh, on the Whittier uh, corridor, um, doing some urban design here, looking at some opportunities for sustainability, um, to, exempt, uh, to um, exhibit art, um, but also to create some new spaces for community folks to gather. Uh, and so this was a, a really nice project. And this group, these groups uh, put together a coalition. They are now putting, they have now written grants and they are um, currently putting uh, pocket parks along this corridor as part of their plan. Uh, this next project, uh, we, and this is an older project, but I wanted to show this because of uh, the connection to urban agriculture. Um, and uh, so there's, there's a group, neighborhood neighbor, uh, Neighbors Building Urban Gardens, um, uh, and they wanted to do this local food system house. Um, they were able to get uh, purchase the property. I, they, I know they've made some improvements, but the idea was that um, to create a greenhouse within the house, uh, the existing structure that was there, and then to be able to use uh, reuse rainwater to be able to start their uh, crops um, uh, over the winter, um, which then they move outdoors. Uh, and um, so it's looking at how they can be sustainable, teaching skills to uh, folks um in in uh, uh, at the beginning the very beginning of the food system in, in the urban agriculture area uh this next project is, is this is just a brochure that we put together um a study actually we did a charrette with this group the uh, detroit river project and they're looking at getting uh heritage status bestowed upon the detroit river um the, due to the role that the Detroit River played uh, in freedom seekers uh, uh, and formerly enslaved people seeking freedom. Uh, and so Detroit was a major stop on the, on the road to freedom. And it's been very well documented. And so this statue is on the Detroit side. There's an accompanying statue on the Canada side. Um, and so uh, we worked with them uh, in um, understanding assets and looking at how to leverage um, assets uh, for uh, uh, heritage tourism. Uh, this next project, uh, Avis and Ellesmere, is a building that um, we partnered with um, one of the faculty members on this and, were, and, and won several awards. Uh, this was a, a, an abandoned building at one point. Uh, we came in and it's now a headquarters for a community-based organization uh, that works with youth in Southwest Detroit, work, working with local artists uh, and uh, local metal workers um, to uh, make an, a really wonderful space. We had a retreat here once and it's the, the space is actually absolutely beautiful. Glass doors that open up to the out, outside, um, really wonderful space. And we're really happy we were able to work on this project uh, with the community. 
So here's one of my favorites, Brilliant Detroit. And there's a whole host of these projects that we've done now uh, with Brilliant Detroit. Brilliant Detroit is a nonprofit organization in, uh, that uh, puts uh, l purchases homes. They purchase homes in communities working with the local folks in the community block club or neighborhood association. They purchase these homes and develop literacy centers. And it's right in the neighborhood. They oftentimes purchase two or three vacant lots next to these homes. And so we said, well, let's let's um, see what the young people want. And so we take cardboard out. We take drawings out. They draw, they sketch, they cut and paste. And then they take cardboard and build what they would like to see on the site. And this is really a great project. Um, we have a lot of fun with the young people here. Um, this is the tree house that came out of the discussions and the work with the, the young people. Uh, and here's the rendering. And they've actually, uh, we actually recommended that they, they paint the street here. And guess what? They, they did it. So uh, we're hoping the rest of the work gets done as well. But um, this is one way to, to uh, number one, slow traffic in the area, but to um, for folks to see in the community to see that something is happening. It's not just a discussion. It's not just um, you know oh those those folks are doing something down there. They're they're making changes in the community and making places of joy for the children in the neighborhood. Uh, this next project, uh, North Cork Town Urban Design Guidelines, and the reason I show this project is because most of our work with this, uh, with the community group um, in this in the, in this project, we met in the basement of a church. Um, but one, we said, well, look, we want to do something, you know, where we can reach a, a larger audience. So they said, oh, well, we'll have it at Nancy Whiskey. Nancy Whiskey is a bar. We have not done engagement in a bar before, uh, but this was really interesting because we had folks come, you sign in, you get a ticket for the buffet, you can go you know, get food, you can also get a drink, um, and you also get what we called North Cork Town Cash. So you got these dollars that we made, and you went around the boards, and they have little slots, and you can invest your dollars in these different um, uh, in these in these different scenarios, um, which then gives you the opportunity gives us the opportunity to prioritize what's most important to the community. And what happened here was that some people who would never come to the community meeting came and got involved. Uh, and the other thing is that the some firefighters were happened to be there that evening and. Uh, celebrating the life of a fallen uh, comrade in, in their work, uh, and they got involved. And we heard some stories about why it's called North Cork Town, because the insulation was made of cork because there were cold storage buildings. And they told us when these buildings catch on fire, they burn hot and long. And so that creates a problem for the fire department. But we never would have known that information uh, had we not gone to Nancy Whiskey that night. And we set these boards up and people put their dollars in, their Cork Town cash. And then we came out with a series of priorities, which then allowed us to develop um, uh, some, some uh, urban design guidelines. Um, Detroit Horsepower, this is a wonderful project. Um, Detroit Horsepower is a nonprofit group that uh, teaches urban youth um, how to care for and how to ride horses and to understand what the needs are for, for, for caring for, for an animal of this, um, of this size. And so they came to us and we wanted to talk about um, what, what, what the youth that are in this program are going to bring to the table. And so we met with the youth. They cut, collaged, pasted. Um, told us, you know, we have to have two fences. We have one fence around the entire site and then individual fences inside. So if they get out of one of those, you still have the second fence. Um, and so these young people were just great, but they understood the care that horses need and are able to articulate that through uh, their work. 
And so we developed um, some renderings. We This has now been passed on to uh, an architecture firm that's now, I believe, they're working on CDs at this point. So we're really excited to see this uh, project come online. Uh, this next project, uh, Skinner Park, this, this is a little older project, but I think it's really important to show. Um, this is in the Denby neighborhood in Detroit, the far east side, uh, a neighborhood that um, has had a lot of challenges. Uh, as industry moved out, this neighborhood was left uh, with no, not a lot of jobs, small businesses closing up, um, and underserved in many different aspects. So working with the students at this school, uh, the, the school, Denby High School, uh, we were actually there to work with them um, on their capstone projects. But one of the young ladies mentioned in, in our discussion, she, her focus was on recreation. So she was going to work on, do this recreation project and present and defend it. And so we were advising on those projects. And she said, you know, this neighborhood is under served by parks. I said, really? Well, what does that look like? So I pulled some maps down, but if you, you look in the red area, you can see there's only two parks in the entire neighborhood. And one of the parks was none but a large practice football field next door to the high school, which hadn't been used in 20 years, I believe. So we um, had this thing when we were working on Detroit Future City, we had these uh, panels we developed called the Road Show. And we would put these up in different areas throughout the city. So we did this at Skinner or at um, Denby High School. So working with the, the youth there, um, engaging with them uh, about this, the, this lack of recreation in the neighborhood. I mean, these kids went door to door, started block clubs in the neighborhood, uh, were able to get buy in by the community. Um, and, then, and then I said, well, what does this look like, this safe? park that you're talking about. So I brought in a bunch of magazines and maps and asked them to cut and collage their vision. And you can see the lower corner here. Every child loves a fun place to play. Every child t deserves one too. And I thought that was so powerful because they know that this community is under-resourced uh, and they get it. And so I said, well, let's, let's take a look at this. They cut and collaged. We eventually had the entire um, senior class cut and collage. We met with the, the, the class uh, president and student government. Uh, we met with some of the underclass, uh, members of the underclass, uh, and we, we came up with some ideas. I did a sketch. The Kresge Foundation gave us some money. We split that with one of our community partners, and we went back to work. And then a group came in and said, well, you know, um, we think this is great. So we're working with the school district, we're working with the, the teachers and the administrators and the student government here. And a group came in and said, well, well, we'll come in and help develop this project for you. And the community said, well, we got to vote on it first. Number two, you, you, you don't just walk in our neighborhood like that. Uh, and so the community uh, voted to work with this, this group. They then said, well, we'll bring our, com our committees together. They said, yeah, you can bring your committees, but we're going to co-chair those committees with you. You're not just going to chair these committees because you don't know this neighborhood and there are things that you guys are doing in, in your committees that we need to learn so we can learn from each other. And this is how the, the meetings got really big. Um, but we were able to put all of this together with volunteers, um, the head of the organization uh, that came with funding, uh, came with volunteers, also helped to raise funding. And here's one of the community members, Sandra Turner Handy. And it's really amazing when you can step away and let somebody from the community present to the mayor. So here's the mayor of the city of Detroit. And Sandra Turner Handy is, is telling him what, what's going to happen here. Uh, and this is a city space. And, it was, and so the city was like, oh, this is great. Uh, and so the project, um, uh, we worked on drawings, we, uh, lots of meetings, um, renderings, uh, and then a kickoff. And we, you know, we had meetings on site. Um, students came back from, who graduated, came back to help work on the project and actually were hired by one of the community groups.
to um, uh, do public relations for the, the project, a journalism major, young man in the green in the lower corner. Volunteers came out to help. A uh, total of, I think, I think it was like 8,000 volunteers came over, the, over a week's time, um, as well as construction folks. And the gentleman who owned, uh, one, of, one of the graduates of Denby High School actually owns a company called Coverworks and they do um, um, buildings, um, recreation buildings. And so they came out uh, and we built a pavilion with a stage, um, picnic tables, um, and then basketball courts for the community. We actually built two basketball courts, um, volleyball court, a pickleball court, a putting range, um, a putting green rather, and, and uh, horseshoe pits as well as um, enhancements to an existing playscape on the site. This, uh, so out of that discussion of we have nowhere safe to hang out uh, in this young lady's recreation uh, uh, capstone, we ended up with a $1.4 million park. So coming up on, on um, uh, the last project here. This is uh, Detroit Future City. It started out called being called Detroit Works Long-Term Planning, but eventually this is what was uh, produced, um, kind of a 50-year plan. It wasn't a master plan, but it was developed uh, in uh, to understand the existing conditions. I mean, and and so at, during this time period, Detroit. General Motors went bankrupt, Chrysler went bankrupt, and the city went bankrupt, all while we were working on this. Um, and so there was a lot of um, folks were very uneasy, folks were confused, didn't know what was going on. Are they closing? The, the, the mayor at that time made some unfortunate um, comments about, well, we're going to have to close some neighborhoods down. and. So then people are like, oh, so you're coming to close my neighborhood? Where am I, you know, I'm on a fixed income, how do you, you know? And so there was a lot of, there was, so there was an uproar actually. And we weren't working on this project when it first started, the city was working on this. And the mayor came to one of the meetings, they invited 500 people to this community meeting, 1500 showed up, they had to take the mayor away. The people in the meeting took over all the microphones. Um, and so they came to us and asked us if we would, uh, if we would, would get involved in this. And, you know, some people were like, oh, that, this might hurt your reputation, you know. Um, Dan Patera, who's the executive director at the time, said, I think if this is done right, we can, we can make this work. Uh, and so we took it on. And there were some non-negotiables with him. Uh, we we're going to have a home base, a space to that the public can come to between nine and five, so they don't have to go try to park down downtown and go up in some 25, 40 story building and find some room. No, we're going to have a place right in the in Detroit's Eastern Market where the public is welcome at all times. That if there are meetings going on, they can come sit and, and watch the meetings or take part in the meetings. As soon as we put maps up, they're welcome to come see them. So it was open source. It was it was one of the big things. The the problems with the previous work that had been done was that they they weren't being totally authentic and they weren't being transparent. And those were two things that we said we are definitely going to do. We're going to be transparent and we're going to be authentic. And that's how we were able to make this thing work. Because what we had to understand was that. Where does Detroit's future really lie? And one of the things we always say at the Design Center is that we as designers bring our technical expertise and our design expertise to the table, but the community, are, folks in the community are experts too. And where we overlap those two is where we find Detroit's future. And also we, we put together this org chart 
And if you'll notice that we've got the city of Detroit over here working on long or short term strategies and there's the mayor's advisory task force. We have an interagency work group, the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation. We have a steering committee there. Then we have the long term strategy team. We fell on the civic engagement side. The planning side was Tony Griffin and Stoss Landscape Urbanism, Bureau Happold and some others. And then we had a group called process leaders. These were folks in the community who are already doing work in the neighborhoods. So Luther Keith's group, um, Arise Detroit, he can send one email and reach 300 community-based organizations, right? Moses, uh, Poncella Hardaway at Moses came to the table. She can send, they organ, Moses organizes uh, churches. So she can send one email and you've now reached 300 churches. Uh, and so we had a whole group that, that worked to develop the way that we would engage the community. Not that we're, we've got it all figured out and we're going to go do th this. We worked with the, we call them the process leaders because they developed the process by which we engaged. And then we had some round table groups and working groups. But you can see at the bottom that the community is at the base of all of this. And so who is the community, right? You got residents, but some residents don't work in the city, but you got some residents that do work in the city or they have, may have businesses in the city. So you've got all these bubbles and there are even more, right? There's more bubbles than this, but it's, it's, if we have a mosaic, if you will, of people, then we need a mosaic of tactics to reach those people. And so this is where we developed a whole series of, of, uh, tactics to do outreach. Um, you know, we had uh, a set of um, what we called community conversations. Uh, we had uh, Detroit 24-7 online gaming, uh, the home base where people could come in uh, and see all the maps. We did open house events. We had the road show, like I showed before at the high school. We had a thing called the roaming table, which we built out of recycled materials where you could pack it up, throw it in the car, and pop it up anywhere all over the city. So, And it be, actually took on its own life. And people would, hey, could you bring that table thing to our um, community barbecue? We got some things we'd like to say. And so we did that. Um, we had different working sessions with different groups, youth engagement at the schools. Uh, and so this is all the things I mentioned this is the schedule. This is what the schedule looked like. And we did this in one year. I went to 148 community meetings in that one year. Um, along with myself and some others, we actually had conversations with over 6,000 people uh, in that manner. And so we had all the maps up, people could come and we put conversation bubbles so people could see when, com when um, comments um, changed or informed the design or informed the, the plan. So throughout this, um, taking this mosaic of tactics, if you will, we were able to engage and have 163,000 interactions. We kept GIS maps with all of this stuff. We had 70,000 survey responses and over 30,000 conversations between that, the, that roaming table. I would go sit and work in coffee shops and just have conversations with folks. So we, we were able to develop the document. We had a celebration. We passed it out to the community. And this is, um, it's interesting because our current mayor came by the home base. <coughs> Excuse me. And with some advisors and looked at all the maps and dissected all these maps and said, and one of his advisors, I overheard him whisper to him. He said, you don't run your campaign on this. You govern by this. And so now the, the, the current mayor is actually using some of this information um, and setting conditions for things in this document to happen. One of the things that we wrote, Dan Patera made sure he lifted up in the document was that there needs to be an office of implementation. You've got to have an office making sure this stuff can happen. And so now there's the office, uh, Detroit Future City office. They now are functioning as a uh, think tank and to working to change policies and to create policies that will allow things in the document to happen. They're also um, providing grants. 
uh, to community-based organizations to be able to implement some of the things in the document. And so they're really, and they're, and I would, you know, if you get an opportunity, go to their website, they're looking at equity, um, they're looking at businesses, they're looking at a whole series of different things uh, for the city of Detroit. So one last thing I wanted, to, because we started out and we talked about good trouble, right? And we talked about civil rights and John Lewis has been such an advocate, um, you know, from civil rights era and just the things that he's gone through. Um, and so I just wanted to read this quote, uh, uh, freedom is not a state, it is an act. It is not some enchanted garden perched high on a distant plateau where we can finally sit down and rest. Freedom is the continuous action we all must take and each generation must do its part to create an even more, uh, even more fair, more just society. And that's so important. And I think um, with the students, um, it, it's on. It, it's up to you guys, right? You have to come in and do your part as well. Uh, and so I just want to, in ending, just uh, leave you with that quote. This is a young lady from one of our workshops who had to had who wanted to build a stage so the birds could could sing from the stage. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor uh, Cross. I'm going to applaud uh, massively. I'm sure we have a massive audience applauding. <laughs> applauding. I'm, I'm Peter Stemple. I'm another member of the lecture committee uh, together with Professor Pennypacker and uh, Professor Sosa. And um, it's really an honor to have you here. One thing we didn't say at the outset is, is that when we queried students about who they wanted to hear from, you were one of the most popular choices out there. And I think your lecture tonight um, really speaks to our students' desire to make a real and meaningful difference in the world and to do, as you just said, and take, take real action. So we're opening the floor uh, to questions, and um, which Lauren is uh, relaying to me. So, um, so, hi, Charles. Thank you for a wonderful set of design stories. Can you say more about the horse farm did the project make any connections between landscape for health, equine therapy, and therapy in medically underserved communities? And unfortunately, I don't know who that's from, but thank you for the question. Please put any questions in the chat. They'll be related to us. Uh, yes, absolutely. We, um, we put a task force together to work on this project. Um, the, the, the organization Horsepower was already in existence. So they've been working for several years. They just have to take the youth outside of the city uh, to work with the horses. And so they, um, and they've, they, they take them on field trips and other things. But we engaged with, um, uh, we, uh, I actually went to the veterinary center at Michigan State. We met with some folks there. We went to a rodeo up at Michigan State. Um, we visited several horse farms, but we also um, had them on the task force. Um, and so one of the some of the things that that horsepower is finding is that the students that are in this program, they're getting better grades. There's less behavior issues. Uh, and so there's things like that. There are these benefits that they're finding now um, and they're supporting the, the youth in those areas that they they have issues. Um, and so we're, we're finding that that's part of it, um, that we've, we've brought in um, uh, different equine um, program directors and veterinarians and um, uh, visited multiple sites uh, and brought uh, other people in um, to, to kind of address some of these issues. And so to understand that, hey, you know, these stables are nice, but we may need a place where we could segregate a horse that may have some behavior issues at the time. Um, and so we were, you know, so it was a, 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 a very big learning curve, but we were able to put together a really decent place with classroom space. Um, they've got people, different uh, folks that come in that work with horses, that have horse farms, that run um, uh, riding 
of stables and different things that come in and are a part of this program. So yeah, there's been a lot of different um, engagement around around that. I mean, we've had multiple um, meetings. We've had uh, people from the city uh, planning commission uh, looking at, you know, well, I don't know if that's allowed under the zoning, but guess what? It's educational. So because of its because it's educational and the site used to be a former school site, then that that, you know, that makes a difference. And so um, because there used to be a, a, a farm called Catherine Ferguson Academy, which was a farm in Detroit, uh, with animals for uh, um, uh, pregnant teens and young mothers. And once again, so they understand that working with the animals has a way, is a way to um, alter and, and to, to, to change people's circumstances. So we also have another question about uh, challenges. And um, I'll just mention to the audience, we had some technical issues with the public chat earlier. So you may need to refresh your browser if you're having difficulty with it. Um, so the question is, what percentage of these great ideas are actually becoming physical reality? And what does it take to go from paper to place? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, I would say, you know, we, we, we do these, a lot of these we do, um, and it just depends on the, the organization. I would say probably about maybe 40% of these actually are, are projects that are, are, are um, going to have a shovel put to ground. Um, some of the organizations, we do these renderings and we develop these projects so they can go fundraise. Um, so we do the pretty pictures, they go raise the funding, and then sometimes we'll work on it or it'll get passed on to another architect or a landscape architect to take it to the next level. But um, yeah, so I would say probably 40, 30, Probably 35, 40 percent of these um, actually are are uh, being done to be built. Some of them are are more planning um, and and more uh, urban design, but more of a planning type of scenario. And some of those do do uh, eventually may have pieces built or pieces uh, of that 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 happen. But it's it's a lot of work. Um, you know, the com working with community partners, especially in underserved neighborhoods, you know, you've got infrastructure issues a lot of times. Sometimes these neighborhoods flood. There's there's a whole host of things um, because of this, the the you know, the abandonment uh, of resources in some of the neighborhoods when there were, you know, when there's no tax money to to come in and rebuild the roads or rebuild the sewers or whatever. What do you do? Um, and so a lot of the things we try to do, we look at um, how we can do this on the fly. So, okay, you want to put in a, a small park here? Okay, we know that there's a group who does free tree plantings. Let's get you connected. So we, one of the other things we do is connect people to resources and connect. we try to help connect the dots for folks. So we've done this plan. You take this and you go see the people over here. They're doing free tree plantings this fall. With volunteers, so and and so there, there's a lot of times things like that happen as well. Wonderful. So uh, and I'll also say that uh, if you're also having trouble with the public chat, you can also click on the wheel and pop out the chat. So here's a question from Sean Rickenbacker. Greetings from your alma mater, CCNY. Hey, Max Bond Center. We're back. Question. I'd love to hear your thoughts on how the physical environment acts as an important determinant of health outcomes mental and physical. And can you spend a moment expanding on the center's work in this realm, specifically with Detroit communities? Oh, absolutely. And and um, I, I love and miss uh, City College. And the, I, I used to work for the, you know, the architectural center before it became the Max Bond Center. So um, I have a deep um, connection there. So um, yeah, so a lot of the work we do um, uh, we do a lot of work uh, in neighborhoods that, that do have health disparities. Um, and so the way we, we usually are invited into communities, we don't go solicit and look for work like that. We folks come to us, um, usually by word of mouth or, 
um, through some sort of connection or because we're connected to a lot of the community development corporations. But um, but when we start talking about health and the physical environment, um, we, uh, as part of our analysis, look at some of the health disparities in those neighborhoods. Um, you know, a lot of, and I don't like the term food deserts, and I maybe mentioned that this morning in one of our discussions, but um, because there's food in these neighborhoods, it's just bad food, right? Uh, and so um, a lot of times we, we look at, um, you know, asthma rates, um, and that's, you know, we look at uh, some of the other health outcomes that um, are being researched and you will find some of these neighborhoods are in bad shape as far as the people's health, diabetes, you know, no access to, to fresh produce uh, in their neighborhood, um, you know, so many expressways and freeways going through the city. Um, you know, so there's all these things. So, what you know, we're working on a project now uh, in Southwest Detroit, or in in the well, in the Southwest, the four eight two one seven neighborhood. Uh, and the the we're working. This is a project called Elizabeth Serenity Park. Uh, the park is for a woman's mother who passed away from cancer, and they live about two blocks from the Marathon oil refineries. And you can see the fumes, and you can, and ten people on that block, and I, I don't know how many houses are on that block, but ten people all have died of cancer on that block. Um, and so this is, you know, this is really important when we're looking at air quality. Um, some of the work in the Detroit Future City document goes to. Um, how we can mitigate some of these things using, um, you know, greening the two, three blocks next to the highways, um, looking at how we can manage the stormwater differently, um, how, you know, looking at contamination uh, and, and where we shouldn't be uh, doing things. So there's a whole host of issues that, that come forward when we start looking at um, the health of people. And a lot of times, what the folks in the neighborhood want, they want a walking track. We want somewhere safe that we can walk and get exercise. Um, we want a place where we can have a, a farmer's market and buy fresh produce. And so a lot of these, we translate that into, once again, um, creating those spaces for those uh, amenities, but also linking them to resources to help occupy those, those, those spaces um, with the uh, the things that the community needs. So it's it's a lot of work, um, and there's a lot of um, it, it's really it's really tough. Uh, I'll tell you, just with the level of um, contaminants. And thank goodness our our local incinerator has been shut down. Um, but you know, when we pulled up to our community meeting last week, we got myself and our executive director. Uh, she got out of her car. I got out of my car, and you could smell the refineries and and you know and you've got areas with the zoning that you've got houses right next to factories if this factory explodes there's going to be a catastrophe here you've got some of these factories right next door to schools and it, it, it's, it's like how did how did we let this happen uh and so we try to look at mitigating some of these issues um in the best ways possible um trying to look at green solutions um, and, and as well as just, you know, other other ways to connect folks to resources um, that their communities may need. Wonderful. Um, of course, I have a million questions, but I'm not going to ask them because we have a question <laughs> from our collective group of students here in the Stuck Building. I really want to shout out to our students who are having a watch party um, and everybody else. I mean, your enthusiasm for professional Cross is noted and awesome, and I'm so thankful for it. Um, so from them, they say, and I'm just going to read directly, um, you've worked with a lot of A-list practitioners, and now you're practicing good design with people that are not often associated with A-list work. What makes public service-based design at just as A-list as the other work? Uh, I, I think, you know... I, I think you've got to look within yourself 
and and say who who am I and who do who am I being um, and and I always I ask this of my students all the time are you designing who are you designing for are you designing for a client who's paying you a fee are you designing for your portfolio or are you designing for regular people who need who who just want to you know go about their everyday thing and have a close park that they can take the kids down to get some recreation you know who are you designing for i think we have to ask ourselves that um you know and and you know as far as working with a list i i would i would have to probably flip that on its head and said the a list people i'm working with are the people in the neighborhoods um, the biggest asset that any community has are the people, and we've got to remember that, that the people in the neighborhood are the asset, um, and, let's, and, and let's treat them like the asset and the experts they are in their community, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll stick by that to the end, um, because I just think, you know, and I've, I've, had, I've had some great opportunities and worked with some really wonderful folks, um, really meaningful work as well, um, all of it. But I really, uh, where my passion lies is in these neighborhoods out here um, and in these communities where, you know, the, 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 the folks can't let their kids go out and play because, of, you know, it, it's dangerous or it's not safe or, or they have to drive them to a park, you know, 20 minutes away. They should have a park in their neighborhood. They should be able to walk down the block and go to the park. And so I really, that's, uh, you know, everybody deserves good design, right? And, and, and the folks in the neighborhoods need to be the patrons driving that process and being uh, involved in that process all the way. Now, not to say that some of these other, other organizations and other firms and whatnot um, can't do that. They, they can. And a lot of times for profit margins and things, it doesn't make sense. But we're working with folks who are, are, are holding some of some of the folks are holding the neighborhood together with toothpicks and bubble gum, and so um, if we can come in, work with them, partner with them, um, develop you know a project for them. Sometimes we even write grants to pay for our fees because we do charge fees. Um, you know that that the folks in those neighborhoods and in those communities. Um, because when you work with folks in the community, you just don't come in and parachute in, right? We believe that engagement equals um, that community engagement um, does not equal just community meetings. It equals relationships, and that's what we that's what we build. We build relations. I've got neighborhoods I can call right now and find out when they're having their next barbecue, and I will be at their next barbecue. Um, so I go to a lot of these things to maintain. After going to 148 community meetings in one year, I, I go back and spend time with these organizations and with the groups. I'll go back when they're having their back to school. You know, I'll bring a couple backpacks with school supplies or whatever. But it's maintaining that connection with the folks that you're working with. That's where your authenticity shows. Um, working with, you know, and 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 you know I've got I go out and I've gone on and worked with them in in some cases and went on tree planting day or hey we're gonna clean up the neighborhood this week okay I'm coming out I'm bringing some trash bags and got my gloves um, and so staying involved with the community uh, is very important as well so um, you know that's 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 kind of where I I the sweet spot for me is and I kind of learned that at City College. Um, in my landscape architecture studio, Lee Weintraub had us working with a group in the South Bronx. And, you know, um, one of the things he did was had the, 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 the community folks come up and do desk crits. And, you know, you get a desk crit from somebody from the neighborhood who's like, hey, man, nobody's coming to that. What do you think? You know, no, nah, man, this is not going to work in our neighborhood. So you have to rethink what you're doing. Um, you're designing for the people in that neighborhood, and they're experts in their neighborhood. So it's important that we treat them as such. And I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, so you have a, a brief time left, and um, I have a uh, that, that was uh, appreciate that answer. Thank you so much. Um, and also, I think it's just great inspiration for our students and for us. Um, 
from Professor Spr Spangler, um, who you spent some time with. He said, I noticed you don't talk about Detroit or show visualizations of Detroit in a way that romanticizes the abandonment of infrastructure and vacancy as an opportunity for experimental landscape design. I remember some years ago when this was very stylish in landscape mm -hmm. architecture. Did you notice this trend from designers coming from outside of Detroit? And was it something you had to contend with as you advocate for more people-focused design? Um, yeah, it, the whole ruin porn thing. Um, there was something about this gaze uh, at the at the destructed lives of people and property um, that just is a turnoff. Um, you know, I, I did my master's with Michael Sorkin at City College in the uh, urban design program, and we spent our year, um, we were supposed to go to Mexico and work with Teddy Cruz, and then Katrina happened, and Michael said, listen, you guys talk amongst yourselves. Everything's set for Mexico, but we can go down to um, uh, we could go down to New Orleans and Biloxi and maybe help some people out. And we were like, no need to talk about it. Set it up. And so that's what we did. And one of the things one of our fixers told us was like, he said, he said, do not go in any of these people's homes. These are still people's homes, right? That that's someone's house, someone's home. Someone's belongings are there, their photos of their family. Um, and, and, and you so often, you know, hear people coming in and don't get me wrong. If you come in and you connect with the community and you're working with a community group and, you know, that's one thing, right? But you got the people who parachute in. They didn't drive in so they could see everything. They parachuted in. And so they have no idea what, what, what's going on. Um, except for what Google maybe told them. Uh, they, there was a group that came in that uh, from France, and they were going to film, do a documentary on the 50,000 packs of dogs that were running wild through the city. And they got with this woman, and she drove them from end to end in the city, and they never found their 50,000 dogs, right? And so I think um, when working, when work, when coming from outside and working in a, in especially underserved communities, it's important that you partner with someone who's already on the ground and has deep roots in the neighborhood. Um, that's the best way to do it because then you you you're you're working with them, um, and it, it's it's also a respect thing, right? Um, respecting the people, respecting their spaces. You know, there, there's a group that came in to one neighborhood and said, oh, we're going to put this over here, and we're going to put that over here, and we're going to do this and that and the other. Well, come to find out the site that they were getting ready to, um, that they wanted to uh, build whatever it was, there's this thing called John's Carpet House, and we found out about John's Carpet House through engagement. And this guy, John, had this house. He clad it in carpet. And all the blues players would come after hours. They drink liquor and play blues all night. John passed away. The house went into disrepair. Um, so now it's a vacant lot. But his friends went back and built a small bandstand. And on Sundays, somewhere between 700 and 1,200 people come to listen to blues. And they pass a little bucket, and everybody throws a $5 bill in. And the gentleman over here's got a barbecue grill, and he's selling sandwiches. And this guy's over here got his thing, and he's cooking catfish. And you can go out there and spend a day. And and someone wanted to build something over it, so they didn't know, they didn't understand what's already going on. So it's important that you understand what's going on in the community before you start making these grandiose plans. Um, that you know, you got to connect with the community. It, it just I'll say it you know, over and over again, that the it's important that the community be involved in that process because they can tell you where things are and, and what's going on. I, I spoke earlier today to a group and I talked about Miss Jenkins. You know, Miss Jenkins is 80 years old and she sits on her porch and she knows all the business. And sometimes that's where you need to go to get your information. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to be a rule breaker for one second and squeeze in one more. I'm going to ask if you can do one more quick one, hopefully. One okay. Quick questions because I, I don't want to keep everyone too long, but 
There's a question from Professor Miller, and um, and I think uh, I really appreciate his help so much and everything that we've done in organizing this. So his question is, the Design Center is committed to providing good design to underserved communities, but the lesser known story is the Design Center is a point of departure for emerging designers as employees and consultants. Can you speak more about how you mentor and center the next generation of designers working in these communities? Uh, absolutely. Um, and it's so important. We 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 kind of do this through multiple ways, and I think I, I talked about it a little bit on the slides. But um, you know, through our teaching. So I teach site analysis and design to second year architecture students, um, and I'm able to uh, uh, interject um, some of this public interest design in in my teaching. When we have, and, I, and I'll tell the students, probably two or three of you all are going to come work for us at the design center at some point. And they, the students go work for firms and they work for government and cities, and, but also they come to us uh, if that's their, their line of interest, is this public interest design. Um, and so we work with the young emerging designers, um, and it's a two-way street. We teach them what we know as they're working on projects, real world projects, but they also teach us as well. And so we that's that's one of the opportunities we have um, in working with our our, our, um, our students um, is is actually bringing them that it's not like they all sit back and they're just sitting in front of the computer the entire time on AutoCAD. No, they come to the meetings, they're doing the renderings, right? They're doing the plans, they're, they're pulling down air photos, um, we're sketching, we're doing analysis work. Um, so we teach them all these different things, you know, even um, some of the aspects of um, working with this, our students and having them help teach the high school students that we had uh, as interns this year. So some of those who may have had an affinity for uh, teaching got to partner with or, or got to spend time with high school students as well. So one of the, that's one of the key things is uh, through the co-op program, uh, students come to work for us. We've also had students outside of our uh, our School of Architecture come and work for us. We have students from, um, oh, good, Oregon and Harvard, uh, from Michigan, from a, a whole host of other schools come work uh, for us too. So the idea is that if you're interested in public interest design, uh, working with communities, engaging communities, um, these are some of the ways that we like to work with um, or, or like some of the ways that we like to make sure we engage the students. Um, also supporting them in going to things like um, the Association for Community Design um, conferences. I'm flying out to New Orleans tomorrow to go to ACD. Um, you know, uh, Design Futures, um, making sure that we have, that they have access to those um, those types of opportunities to, to uh, function in different areas. There's also an AIA retreat that they go up to um, the northern uh, Michigan uh, for as well. Um, so we try to make sure we support them um, in their, in the, their uh, educational endeavors to um, make sure we lift up uh, some of the things that they're, some of their interests as well. So they're going to learn about this public interest design. They're going to learn about landscape architecture. They're going to learn about architecture. They're going to learn about urban design. Um, but they're also going to learn about engaging community around and the importance of engaging community um, around these types of uh, projects and this type of work. Um, even when there are snafus and things go south, we, we walk them through, okay, here's what happened, this blah, 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 you know, and now we've got, so now we've got to go do this. And so we work work with them, and so they understand um, what that process looks like, and and how to um, uh, how to engage in, in in that. And we, it's interesting that a lot of the people that work for us now were actually students at one time. So, well, we were all students at one time, which is <laughs> things. Um, so it's incredibly inspiring, and I know uh, many of us on the faculty. Uh, I'm not the only one who says it, but I say it to all of our students. You're not just learning and preparing for the future. You are actors in the world right now. and You're making a dis difference and everything you do can help communities and empower communities to advocate for themselves and to lift people up. 
you know, and foster larger changes, right? That that pick, pay, project that stays on paper may never get built, but that might be what spurs someone to become an activist, to do other things, advocate for other things. So this is so inspiring. Um, I am inspired, and I just, I want to thank you on behalf of Penn State and our faculty and the lecture committee and everyone involved uh, for your inspiring lecture tonight. Bravo. Well, thank you so much. And you guys, I I really want to physically come and visit you all now. I, I'm really, and so we're going to have to make that happen. Um, but thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm, I hope I was able to... Um, uh, uh, to get a lot of this across. Um, there's a lot, and there's, you know, this could have been a two hour lecture, right? But um, that's, we'll save that for another time. But I thank you so much for all your uh, kindness and all your help. Um, Mark, thank you for all your, your hard work. Um, and I just want to thank uh, everybody on your committee over there and uh, for the work you do. Um, this has been just a, a pure delight for me uh, to be able to share um, the work we do. And thank, thank you to the students for making Professor Cross feel welcome.